We've had a very good turnout today. I want to thank everyone again for joining me. I think we can formally kick this off. And I was told I need to share my webcam because that's what you do when you haven't had a haircut in three months. So that's what I will do. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. This is Jeff Besson with Intua Face. You've probably heard a lot from us over the past couple of months. We've kept pretty busy considering uh, how much has been going on in the world these days. So. Uh, I'll be joined today by Sebastian Munier. He's our senior customer success manager. He'll be your host for today. Uh, he'll be doing the walkthrough. We are also joined by Alexi Camacho, who is also a customer success manager. Uh, Seb will do the presenting. Seb and Alexi will also be answering questions throughout the webinar. And as promised in the email invite, we'll also have, an, uh, I hope, an extensive Q&A session after the walkthrough. So you can use the questions panel throughout the webinar to ask questions, we will answer them on the fly, but we will also stick around after the walkthrough for a live uh, Q&A. Uh, hopefully we'll have a camera on Seb too. I shouldn't be the only one who has to tame his hair. So let's get started. Uh, we announced reference designs uh, last week. Uh, let me just, if you indulge me, allow me to redefine these things one more time. Uh, reference designs, we actually like Wikipedia's reference design definition, which is a technical blueprint of a system that exists so others can copy it. That's what we're doing with our reference designs. We are creating a, an example that is fully functional, but intended to be adapted. This initiative will cover multiple scenarios across a variety of uh, verticals and use cases and target audiences. We started with a focus on the pandemic because there were a couple of use cases that came up over and over again. Next slide. So if you go to our website uh, under the learn menu, I believe, you'll now have a new entry for reference designs and toaface.com reference designs. You can see the two first reference designs that we launched. I imagine a lot of you have done that already. We have entrance flow management, the topic for today as well as multi-mode experiences, multi-mode interaction, which we actually launched, I don't know, about a month ago, but not formally as a reference design, just as a sample available to everybody. We've had some good market reaction. I don't know if you guys like reading the trade papers in the digital signage world. We actually got some nice coverage about a reference design initiative. Uh, from 69, uh, the point that Dave was making is that uh, he's been, talking with lots of clients about how to react to the new needs of this pandemic uh, to accommodate people who have maybe concerns about touch screens or uh, need to manage the flow into their small store, for example. And he wrote that he was stressing the importance of making things easy for partners and end users, that what we're doing is novel and needed by the industry. They shouldn't be predefined locked in solutions. So that was a really nice compliment. And Invitus, which is the big Europe-based uh, consultant with a, a digital signage specialty as well as DOOH, they had a kind of a similar comment, which is that this is a new approach. Most vendors like this proprietary approach. You're limited to particular constraints, zone-based scheduling, HTML5 coding, predefined partners, and this ability to kind of open things up and enable people to do whatever they want is a bit freeing. Uh, Dave used the analogy, it's like giving people the cake mix. So you got all the basic ingredients, everything ready to make the cake, but you can play with that and uh, have your own variants. Uh, we did launch again multi-mode interaction a few, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, last month, two months ago, like, time goes by fast, where we illustrate how you can offer touch alternatives at a kiosk. Uh, I can tell you that touch isn't going anywhere. That's another webinar, but touch is here to stay. It's not going away. Don't panic. Don't think you have to uh, redeploy all your experiences using voice and mobile phones. Touch is not going away. But it makes a lot of sense to offer touch alternatives. And so this multi-mode interaction framework is a uh, ready-to-launch experience, illustrating, in this case, on Windows, touch, speech, and use of a personal mobile phone. But it exists to be customized. And then there's entrance flow management, the topic of today's webinar. We released this just last week. I don't have to tell you this is an important use case these days, which is managing 
the flow of people in and out of a store or a museum or a school. I imagine the list could be very long, right? So uh, I'm, I'm very eager to uh, walk through this use case, but that's what we're here for with Seb. So we're gonna start the walkthrough right now with Seb, but again, as we go through this, we're monitoring the questions panel. So please feel free to ask questions at any point. We'll answer those questions on the fly. And uh, we will also please stick around for that Q&A at the end of the session as well. So let me get that started for you with Seb. Hi, this is Seb here, and today I'm going to walk you through our first reference design, the entrance flow management. Before we dive into the experience in Composer, just a quick reminder. On our website, among the Learn menu, Reference Designs, this is where you can find uh, these new designs that we, we propose you today. Uh, on the page, we have two at the moment, the entrance flow, which we'll look at today, and the multimode experience. If you go into the details, each reference design will have some descriptions, scenarios, screenshots, a usage video, and uh, some objectives and details. What is important to, for us today is this Help Center article. So let's have a look at that again before diving into the experiencing composer. Uh, the video is here again, just in case, and we have some details about the experience structure. So let's have a quick look at that. In this entrance flow management, we have two experiences that you can download from the marketplace. The main experience, which is going to be the brain of the whole system, and the additional experience, which can be used either for secondary screens on your main entrance or for additional entrances. In any case, that's one main experience and as many additional experiences as you want. As you will see in the article, we talk about human-based counting or automated-based counting. In the two cases, these are triggers sent to this main experience, to the brain of the system. With a human-based counting, it can be something as a keyboard or a clicker by using the page up and page down, like you would use PowerPoint, um, sending a keyboard trigger to the main experience. If the agent is using a mobile phone with the web page, we can use the web triggers, as you may have seen in the real estate shop window or the multimode experiences on the marketplace. If you decide to use a third-party automated counting system, as we did in the video with the proof of concept based on Vino, again, it's yet another trigger that you can add to the main experience. And I will show you today how to add this system uh, on your own. Once the main experience receives this information, it computes the status. Is it okay? Yes, no. Can the people enter uh, or no? And then broadcasts the messages to all the additional experiences using tags and credential keys. Going a bit further, we said the brain is basically a counter, and it is basically a simple counter. We are adding one or subtracting one to the actual count when someone gets in or gets out of the store, whatever input is used. And we can summarize the logic with this very simple diagram. The store opens, people can enter. When someone enters, we do a plus one. When someone exits, we do a minus one. Each time we checked, are we at capacity? If yes, we go to red. People must wait until someone exits, and then we compare again. If we are below capacity, we're good. We stay green, people can still enter, and we display the updated count of people, uh, remaining people that can enter. I will let you go through the article to get more details about human-assisted counting, automated counting solutions. We mentioned a few of our partners here that do based on classic security cameras, CCTV cameras, or 3D cameras. Uh, you can check the references in the Help Center article, or even just sensors like Nexmosphere. In some cases, it can be um, good enough. Okay, let's now dive into the experience itself. This is the one I just downloaded from the marketplace. You can see I'm at, uh, at read-only right now, so you'll get exactly the same thing in your composer. Uh, the first thing we want to look at, or among the interface sets. The brain I was talking about is going to be this actual account counter. But before that, let's have a look at the settings. This is an Excel file that will enable you to set your web trigger credential key if you want to use the, uh, the smartphone uh, web page to control the screen. 
the maximum occupancy or capacity of your store. Uh, the link to your web page, this is ours. If you want to build your own web page, this is where you would put your link. That will be used to generate the QR code for the staff people to scan the code and get the quote unquote app, the web page on their phone. And this is just a, a debug value for all the warnings we put for you in the marketplace. So you can just set this one to false. All right, I've set my credential key now in Excel, uh, so we can move on. Again, this actual account is going to be the brain, and it's a simple brain, right? Uh, if we look at the triggers, we have two of them. When the counter is less than the maximum occupancy, the capacity coming from the Excel settings, then we uncheck this toggle button. And we send a message that will be the broadcast to the additional experiences. When we are above or equal to the capacity, we check this button and we send a broadcast message. Now, this button itself, what is it going to do? If we have a look now at the, the scene structure, it's a single scene experience, right? We just have a, another settings scene to let you enter your credential key at runtime and to scan the code, but the scene is very simple. This toggle button here is among the controllers and we'll do two very basic things, hiding a layer and showing the other one. So this right now, the green one is the layer enter. If I hide this one and show the weight, we get the green one. Another thing we have in this layer enter are these uh, messages here actually, which are in the recommendations layer, sorry. These are set again from Excel file here uh, for demo purpose for the marketplace. If we look in this uh, Excel file, we have a list of sentences and icons which are going to cycle through in this swap collection using the automatic scroll. You could replace this Excel file with your own CMS, with your table, with whatever data feed you want to use uh, and display either recommendations or ads or messages for the staff. Again, that's the part of the things you can easily customize. So we've seen the counter, but we don't actually know yet how it changes the value. With the human-based counting, we talked about two things. The first one is the, uh, the keyboard, the clicker. So if we look at the experience level, we have a few triggers here. The two which are interesting for us are these two ones, page up, keep trust, and page down. We used page up and page down because these are the most common keys used by the PowerPoint-like clickers, like the ones, again, I was using in the video. So if we look at the, at the trigger itself, when page up key is pressed, then we add one to the count and we log a few things in the data tracking. Uh, actually, in this log event, you will see we log quite a few information which will help us afterwards to build all the charts we want to use. And these automatically computed values based on other interface cells. You can have a look into that, but you don't really have to change that. Uh, you can use it as is, as provided. The second trigger is uh, the page down, which basically does a subtract one on the counter. The only difference, we check if the count is not already zero. So we don't say we have minus two people in the store, which wouldn't be uh, really exact. That's it for the keyboard triggers. Um, I'm going to show you the second one, the smartphone, and then go into play mode to show you a demo of that. So on the web triggers, which are the ones coming from the web page, we actually have almost the same thing. When we receive a message, add one, we add one to the counter, we log an event on the data tracking. When we receive, let me open this one, a subtract one, if the count is greater than zero, we do a subtract one and log an event um, on the data, the data tracking. Okay, let's go in play mode and see what we have. So right now, Let's say this one is my main entrance running on my laptop, and this one here is an additional display running on a bright sand player. My clicker here is connected to my main uh, main monitor, main screen. So if I do a plus one, not sure you see that here, but we went to nine on both screens. So let me go down to one. One people may enter. So we are synced on both sides. Now if I do one more plus one, we go to maximum capacity on one. This one broadcasts the message to the bright sign, which displays the same thing. If I do a minus one, 
we go back to green on both screens. So that's, let's say, the agent here at the main door using a clicker. If now I am the second agent using my phone because we didn't have enough clickers, and I'm connected here at my the second door, so I'm interacting with the bright side player. I scan the code of this second player. If I do a plus one here, again, it sends the message first to the main entrance, which will broadcast back to the second one. And we will use this information in the analytics at the end of the webinar. So I did a plus one, minus one from the second entrance, and I did a bit, a bit more uh, on the main entrance. So this was based on human-based counting, right? the keyboard triggers or the web triggers of the smartphone. In the video, you have seen the automatic counting using a third-party solution. In the case of the video, that was a proof of concept using OpenVINO. I'm going to show you how to add your own system, or your own people counting solution in here, whatever it is. As soon as it has an API, uh, you can integrate this solution in the reference design pretty easily. With the OpenVINO, we decided to use local network triggers, right? So that's another, yet another way to send a trigger to a running player. So I'm going to reuse the actions we already have from here. So I'm going to copy my actions because I'm a bit lazy and I don't want to redo everything. So the add one, I will need that. And the log event, I will need that. I'm doing a right click copy and getting these actions. On our local network triggers, the people counting is going to send us messages. And actually, the guy who wrote the, the piece of code said, uh, count up. We are counting people getting towards the entrance of the store. And then I am going to paste my actions. On the log event, I may need to make sure that all the bindings are correct. This is getting info from Excel. Uh, from some interfaces that's very good. The entrance here was getting information from a parameter of the web trigger. Here it doesn't work. So actually, because I'm a, I'm a local, I'm going to use the device ID of this particular machine. So among my web triggers, I have my device name. This would be the entrance used in this case. All right, that's for the up. And same ID, I'm going to copy here on subtract one and log event. Add a new message is received trigger. Uh, this one is count down. Paste my actions. And again, make sure I'm using the right entrance name, my own device name. All right, let's give this a try. So I'm going to hit play here. And to launch this Python script using OpenVINO, which is the proof of concept we used. All right, so I'm running on a recorded video, so I don't have to move around while doing the test. So one person is detected. While recording my screen, the performance might not be the best. We get a count up. It went to nine here. See the total up above? That was a message sent to my local host saying count up. Let's fast forward a bit. OK, one person is coming out of the store. We see a countdown, and we are back to 10. It's plugged. If you were using another solution, you may use the API Explorer. You may build your own custom interface set. It is really easy just to call this add one, subtract one to the already built experience. You don't have to rebuild everything. And that's the beauty of the reference designs. These are a, a big Lego built on top of some of the bricks, which are already proposed in Composer in the interface platform, up to you to add your own brick and make an even nicer Lego. So that's it for the main experience. Now I want to say a few words about the additional displays, right? And then we will talk about the analytics. So you see, uh, you, you've seen my two uh, machines here, the one here being 
uh, the main experience to one here on the right hand side being the additional experience. How do they communicate to each other? Uh, if I go to my management console and look at my players, right? I'm, I'm running on my account right now. I have three uh, players running, although my composer is uh, in edit mode, so I don't see the screen here. Um, this one was running the main experience. This one is running the additional display experience. If I look at these players in the list view, we can see the tags here, and they all share the same first tag, Chicago home. This is because we decided to use the tags to create this network of players that should communicate to each other. So as soon as you have one main experience running here, it's going to check its first tag, Chicago home, and then we'll send a web trigger to all the players having the same Chicago home tag. The additional display experience will listen to this trigger and update what is displayed here on the screen. If we, if we look back in our main experience here, this is this send message, right? This is actually created with the API Explorer and it's going and it's using a web triggers API. We have one single action, which is sending a message with a message from one, two, and three to certain player tags with a certain API key. And this is what we are doing on our counter when we send a message here. We send to the additional players an enter message with the max occupancy, the number of people allowed inside, which is the one to display on the, on the screen, the average weight, which is another variable computed directly in the main experience, the tags, that's the first tag of this main experience player, and the credential key, so you have the right to use the web triggers. If you want to experiment that, experiment that more uh, manually, another reminder, when you go on your management console, you can always go to Interface API Guide, Web Trigger, Web Triggers API, use the authorized to enter your credential key, and that's the send message we are using. Right? So this post can be called through the API Explorer, and this is what we do in the main experience giving the enter message, the different parameters being the information to be displayed on the screen, and filtering to which players we need to send this message based on the player tags. With this methodology, you can easily add a new player to your network, just give it a tag, deploy the additional experience, done. You have your passive signage, additional screen in the store displaying the right information at the right time. So now let's have a look at the data we logged actually within these uh, two play mode sessions I did. So the first thing I like to do before going into the dashboards and creating my charts and dashboard, I want to understand what data was logged. I want to look at the raw data to have a better feeling about what I can build afterwards. So among the manage analytics data, I'm going to download my data for today in an Excel file. So download here. And that's the file I get. So as you can see, even if I have two experiences running, the main and the additional one, only the main is logging. Again, that's the brain of the system. The main event logged is the people count change with an add or a subtract and having some properties. So I will be able to do some math on the actual count. And if we look here, I should get an average of 5.3 people in the store. And I should be able to know for all these ads, were they done on Seb's entrance, so the main entrance, or the rights and entrance. And obviously, if you were naming your players properly, you could see here main door or, ent or south entrance, depending on the configuration of the store. All right, so we have a good idea of the data. Uh, let's go back to our dashboard. We have a clean dashboard here, and I'm going to start adding a chart from scratch. I wanted to make sure I'm looking at the right events. So the first thing I'm going to do is to filter on the people count changed. So that's the only event that will be important for us today. Uh, first one, let's have a look at the actual count and let's measure that over time. So I'm going to add my timestamp local time here. And I've done logs pretty quickly, right? So let's switch that to second because we are looking at 
today's data. Uh, this is actually useful. In a real setup, you would probably use minutes or hours or even days, again, depending on what time frame you're looking at. I'm going to rename that. That's my actual count. All right. And let's save this. That will be our chart number one. Second one, remember this average occupancy. Uh, this might be something cool to represent in a gauge. So I'm actually going to duplicate this one. That's something I like to do a lot, like the copy and paste of triggers and actions. Because when I do that, I already have all my filters. In this case, I have only one, but maybe I would have filtered on the experience name, on my accounts, am I using my primary or my secondary accounts? So I don't have to redo that all the time. Uh, we want to switch to a gauge. So time is not relevant. And we want to use the actual count, but this time we want an average. That's the five, I'm guessing this is a 5.3. So let's see if we can round this maybe with a decimal. Okay. And then the gauge formatting, we know our max is 10. So let's change the range here, apply. Sounds good. And so that's 5.3 uh, people out of 10. Yeah, sounds good. And this would be my average occupancy for today. Sounds right. So the last one I'm going to show you today is about the entrance which is used. So again, let's duplicate this one and edit it. So we might want to use a pie chart. Let's do that. A pie chart and we want to use as a dimension the, do we have entrance? Entrance ID, would that be it? Yeah, looks like it. I used a lot the Seb's demo laptop and I want to use the accounts. 14 times was used and two times here on the bright side. Now this adds the entries and the exits. Right. If we look again at our Excel file, we have a change type. So I could say I want to use my change type, which is here as a filter and I want to look only at the ads so only when people get in so these are the entries per door right I could save this chart duplicate it use the subtract instead and I would get a different chart so I have two people that exited from the main door and one from the second entrance That's it for the analytics. Uh, you can learn more in the Help Center article. Uh, this concludes the webinar for today. Um, if you are in the live session right now, we, we, we are going to open the question and answers. So feel free to ask anything about this reference design. If you're watching the recording, uh, feel free to contact us on community, on support, or directly from our website to ask any questions about this uh, reference design, entrance flow management. Thank you. Thank you, Seb, very much. Thank you for being so oddly calm and distant at the same time. Uh, Seb, you there right now? Yes, I am. All right, I'm going to give you control. Everybody, thank you for bearing with us. Let's now go to the live Q&A. Seb will be driving, so I'm going to let him share his screen. And uh, the floor is open for questions, guys. So let's show my screen. Sharing screen number yeah, two. Yeah. Okay, good. So hi again, everyone. Uh, as you may have guessed, this was something I, I pre-recorded for today's webinar. Main reason, uh, to be honest, lots of drilling above me in the building. So I didn't want to get this noise uh, during the live session. I wanted to be very focused. So let's open the questions now. Uh, we already answered quite a few. Uh, in the chat box. So let's see, we have a new one from Faisal. Um, I'm a bit confused about primary additional experience. Can I deploy multiple experience at one location? Yes, you can. Imagine a building with multiple entrants and 
each experience will be able to update the people count independently. Yes. So uh, let me go back actually to uh, the Health Center article and the architecture diagram. The diagram is here. All right, so let's assume this is one location. We put store, it could be a building, depending on the situation we are, we are, we are talking about, right? Uh, in this one, so for one single location, maybe a store or a building, you need one main experience. Again, this will be the brain of the system, the one that does the counting. Whether you decide to count manually with a human counter or automatically with a third party solution. Then if you get a second entrance or exit, you can add as many additional experiences, as many counters that you want. All the orders, the counting orders will be sent to the main experience here. So that this one computes the total number and this one decides, yes, you can go in or no, you should wait your, uh, for your turn to be able to enter the building. I hope that answers your question. Now all this, system the one main experience plus the many additional experience will share the same tag player tag and that's how you create this local network of players and obviously you can have as many stores as you want and hello and handle all that in the share and deploy console so this one we're good uh next one just to be confirmed additional screens will consume additional license yes that's correct uh, actually, these ones are still players uh, running on any kind of machine. We did our test uh, with uh, Windows machines, with Android machines, and uh, the Brightson player, as I was using in the in the webinar. So this one we're good. Can you show us the Python Raspberry solution for connecting to interface? So first, there was no Raspberry involved. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Python script was running on my main laptop, the same one I was uh, running the Composer. Um, I could, although uh, it was really a proof of concept and it's based on the Intel OpenVINO samples. Uh, I think we, I put the reference in the Help Center article. Let me scroll down a bit. Uh, automated counting. Uh, so this proof of concept, we reused uh, our friend toolkit OpenVINO from Intel. And that's the, the demo actually, which we used originally and we modified a little bit. So in the Python script, the only thing that can interest you, and actually I do have the script here, is whatever the algorithm does, when you, you see an up, when you detect someone, you send a request to the local IP address the send message, that's a local network triggers. In this case, both the script and the main experience were running on the same machine. So this IP address was basically a local host. But again, don't want to go into the coding, this is not a coding webinar. And that was to illustrate the reference design. Uh, we, I also did an integration with uh, Enlighten, which is a potential partner you could work with. They are using 3D cameras like Intel RealSense. Uh, I do have the integration working in this, uh, in, in this experience I have open right now, instead of having the local network triggers, which we use the OpenVINO, I has this uh, Enlighten IA, it's uh, another .NET piece of IA uh, using MQTT, that's all for the technical side of it, showing that in the end, you got two triggers, you could add one, subtract one, that's it. Uh, all right, thank you, Faisal, for confirming. But Seb, just to reconfirm, the only information you need from a third-party solution is, did somebody come or did somebody go? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So for the Enlighten uh, software or the Axis uh, security cameras, which are pretty famous uh, in, the, in this environment, they usually give you an update of all the ins and all the outs. So between two updates, you compute the difference. And you know if two people got in, three people got out, okay, that's minus one, we're good. Uh, three people got in, depending on the refresh rate, depending on the system. So that's why we let the solution to be as open as it could. Uh, and then depending on how you create this integration using API Explorer, using your own custom interface set in JavaScript or in .NET, uh, you can integrate 
virtually any system you want, right? depending on your preferences, on your partnerships, uh, and on the store setup, right? In some cases, 2D cameras, so regular cameras would be good enough because you have the right angle, you have the right ceiling height, you have the right configuration, hardware configuration setup. Sometimes you may need to go with a 3D camera, which is not sensitive to light, which can work with maybe lower ceilings uh, or has a wider camera angle. Lots of technical stuff, which honestly is a bit beyond our, our, our job here. And Seb, I don't think you mentioned it. Just can you talk briefly about using a motion sensor? Because I know a couple of people are trying to do that. Sure. It's uh, actually uh, here, and that's a discussion I had with uh, our friends at Nextmosphere. So, and I think we have, uh, we do have Patrick here in the webinar, right? Uh, Patrick Felton, I guess you're here. Um, Patrick did a, a, a post on community uh, showing something pretty similar. And um, this would show how to use a classic presence sensor, distance sensor, uh, where let's say you have a kiosk and then on one side, that's the entrance, on the other side, that's the exit. So whenever the signal is cut, the, the presence detects something, that's a plus one. Uh, it works, but you need to make sure that you have separate entrance and exit. You need to make sure it's only one person at a time. You have, if you have two people side by side crossing the signal at the same time, you may not be accurate. So this sensor-based mechanism can work, again, depending on the store configuration. If I may build on that point, by the way, if you look at any third party flow management solution, maybe entirely prepackaged and uncustomizable to the most customizable, they all say should be supplemented with additional counting. You know, nobody is saying they're guaranteeing the count. So I don't want you to expect it from us or <laughs> uh, assume it from anybody else. Nobody guarantees count accuracy. They guarantee count approximately you know so uh, it is what it is uh, i know that our default counting mechanism was manual uh, we can debate whether that's more or less accurate than automated in either case there are no guarantees out there it is what it is uh, and i don't think you need to worry about raids for counting the number of people as long as you're pretty close is probably good enough but uh, keep that in mind we, we don't guarantee for this and you're not going to find guarantees anyplace else at least not at anyone we've been talking to about this. Nothing we've seen that's been promoted by anybody, yeah. Yeah, and I guess Robert balances your question. So the question was, uh, let's say a child is holding a parent's hand right next to them. Have you seen it count at them as one instead of two? I would really say it depends on the system, right? The one we used, again, is a free demo provided by Intel using a 40 bucks webcam. Can it be as good as a, 600 800 security camera or even a 3d sensor actually these 3d sensors just cost 150 200 bucks uh with some five years or 10 years engineering of software behind it probably would do a better job than our proof of concept uh, now does this tool which is an overhead over the head camera be able to grab the child if it's next to the parent probably if the parent is holding the child in his arms yeah maybe not now do you want to condemn as two people that's another question and also, Seb, correct me if I'm wrong, you need to think about mounting. For example, the 3D cameras kind of need to be overhead. Is that realistic at the entrance? Uh, I guess sunlight could be an issue as well. Is that right? Uh, sunlight is not an issue for this 3D camera here, as far as I know. But again, we are not hardware integrators ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't go too far in recommendations here on how to set up a camera in a store. That's not my core skills. Um, question from Marcelo. Um, what happens if the main XP is turned off? Does it reset the counter to zero or you hold the data somewhere? Today, the count will be reset uh, because if we look into the experience again, the count is hold it, uh, is hold in the actual count. It's a, it's a simple counter. Uh, you could obviously change that and have it store the information in Excel. And so when you load the experience again, you reload the last count. Now, would it make sense? Again, it could be a debate. Uh, next question for the main experience, that is, does it needs to be Windows-based? Nope. Nope, this experience, because it's using web, tri web triggers, again, don't look at the local network triggers, that was just for a proof of concept. It's using either uh, 
this little clicker here, and I tested the clicker on bright sign, page up, page down works as well as on Windows. Uh, I could, I didn't test it on my Android tablet because I couldn't plug the USB dongle to the, to the Android tablet, but I'm pretty sure it works as well. Uh, and then when you use the web page on your smartphone, it uses web triggers to send information to the main experience. And web triggers are supported on all the platforms. So no, the main experience can run on Windows, Android, Bright Sign at least. These are the three platforms we tested before releasing the sample in the marketplace. Uh, let me flag this one, we're good. So a uh, question from Maria, uh, where do you put the entrance that is working in, working in the message to know which entrance was used? That's a good point. And actually it happens on, uh, it depends if you're using the clicker or if you're using the web, uh, the web page and the web trigger. So let's let's assume uh, I will go with the webinar, uh, what I did in the webinar. So in the webinar, I had the page loaded on my phone and this one was connected to my additional display. So when I scan the QR code, uh, which brings me to my, to my page here, the page knew this was entrance two. When I click on the button on the web, on the web page on the phone, it sends a web triggers, which arrives here in this web triggers. And when in we do upper, in the upper left there, in the upper left, yeah, yeah, right. here web triggers. When I receive a message, if we look in the log event, and I really hate the latest Windows updates on my laptop, and that's also that's the second reason why I recorded the webinar. Uh, there we go. We use this in the parameter one. So what it means is on the web page, we encoded the entrance name in this parameter one. This is detailed in the Help Center article. And if you look at the little piece of JavaScript, which is hosted on the web page, uh, this is where you will get the message. So when you look into the analytics, you have this entrance ID. It comes mainly from here, uh, from the uh, web triggers. Now, if I was opening the additional entrance experience, right? This one is the main experience. If I was opening the additional one, we would have a uh, keyboard press for the page up and page down. And this would do a send message to the, again, to the web triggers using the device name of this additional experience as parameter one. So same ID, same specifications. So next question from Corey. If you try to make an update to the settings in the Excel while the experience brain is running, does it stop until the Excel file is saved and closed again? Um, well, I, I don't think it would stop in any case because the Excel settings is only used really for the credential key and the maximum occupancy, that's it. So it wouldn't get the new figure until you save the file and close the file, the new maximum occupancy. So it would keep going, but with the wrong value until you save and close your Excel file. Now, typically this kind of settings, again, we did that for the sample in the marketplace. This could be handled not in an Excel file, but maybe in an online CMS like Airtable. And so each store based on the device name automatically gets its capacity from a central database. So you don't have to do this configuration on site. Uh, it might be the same number for all the stores, so a, a hard written number. Uh, there are lots of ways to think about these settings. And in this case, we obviously put the, the credential key as a parameter, so I don't give all of you my credential key on the marketplace, but you can easily put your own. When you create your own experience on that, when you do a save as, just put this hard written for the account you're working on and never change it again. All right, let's go to Robert's new question. So is there a way through the experience that we can track if somebody went through the exits, for instance, where 
for instance, where we live right now, for grocery stores values to have two entrances, it's now one entrance and one exit. But let's say somebody goes in the exit, can this be tracked through this? Um, I would say this is really independent of the experience itself. It's the question is, and if I put again the diagram here, um, if I put again this one, the real question is, who is counting or what is counting? Uh, if you have a, a, a human agent, an employee, uh, with a clicker or with his phone, he can do either a plus one or a minus one. So if he sees someone going in from an ex a supposedly exit, just do a plus one. It will send a plus one to the, the brain, the main experience, you're good. If you're using an automatic counting solution, uh, it really depends. Uh, if you're using something like we did here in the, in the, in the prototype, uh, remember we had these uh, two uh, horizontal bars, meaning that when you cross the two of them in a certain way, it gives you the direction. And that's what is commonly used in, uh, in computer vision-based systems. So if you have such a solution that is able to give you a direction, you can make the difference between an in and an out. If you have a basic distance sensor, which assume that this was a one-way exit only, and you're just waiting to cross a signal, and you have only one signal, you cannot know in which direction the signal was crossed. So this is where you could cheat and, and, and make the system fail by having a, a, a minus one instead of a plus one. But that's, uh, again, really dependent on the hardware setup and the store configuration and the system you decide to use to handle the counting. Robert, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly these days, because there is a capacity management approach, they're limiting it to a single entrance. I imagine employees might go through the exit, and then that does go to Seb's point. Well, how are you counting to begin with? So it's, it isn't really the experience, it's how you can do the counting. Uh, I don't see any more questions, Seb. I guess we can... Ask and see if anybody else has anything more they want to ask. We did record this. I know I know some people couldn't stay for the whole thing. We will uh, send out the recording once it's available. Uh, and remember, everything we discussed is ready for download. It's all up there on uh, intuaface.com slash reference dash designs under the learn menu on our website. Uh, any other questions, anybody? If uh, if you start deciding to integrate your own preferred third party people counting solution, we'd love to hear about it. We want to know what it is you're using. Uh, we're doing our own little research. Uh, there's a variety of options, right? Some Seb showed one through using MQTT. Another one is just a web API. There's lots of different ways to communicate with these systems. The one thing that caught me was that, yeah, a lot of these systems, they don't do plus one, minus one. They just track total in, total out. So you might have to do one little math equation, which is you know out minus in, to get the total in-store capacity, but shouldn't be that much work. I see a couple other quick questions there, so. Uh, any other solution for pandemic you're looking for? Actually, Jeff, you might want to answer this one. Uh, any other solution? So other, are you asking for other reference designs or other things you're interested in? I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, that the general notion of a reference design is not specific to the pandemic. We're going to try to address other use cases we feel are very popular and common. In fact, I think the first one will be sort of an endless aisle kiosk, an in-store product catalog with a shopping cart. That's a very commonly requested scenario. That could be a very good reference design. For the pandemic itself, um, Please suggest, these are certainly the two big ones, multi-mode interaction and entrance flow management were the biggies. Uh, but if you have others in mind, we'd love to hear about it, sure. And we have another question. I'm not sure I, I get it though. Each experience can use automatic counting solution, example, open Vino. So the the, the, the automatic counting here, whether you put one at the main entrance or two or three or four, as soon as you configure them to send information to the main experience, you can have as many as you want and the information is gathered by this main experience to get one single count in the end, which is how many people can enter in the store. Uh, so the main experience needs to be connected to these automated solutions. 
funding solutions. The additional experience, in the end, or just here to display the final result. How many people can enter? Yes, no. And to display the messages. Remember, you have the, uh, at the bottom of the screen, we have the cycling uh, messages about uh, safety guidance, uh, um, social, keep your social distance, wear a mask, or all these kind of things, which are really useful right now uh, as a, a communication media. So the last comment we got is, uh, thank you, Faisal, for that. This is a good reference, and I can definitely use this immediately. Thanks. You're welcome. That's good. really the, the objective for that. Um, new question. Can you use a smart camera to detect temperature? Also count the people. Uh, so that's two questions in one, <laughs> I would say. Uh, obviously, we've been looking into uh, uh, temperature sensors, temperature uh, cameras. And uh, who knows, maybe that could be uh, one, of, one of the next reference designs. We'll see. Um, now, can you use a camera-based, a, a temperature camera to actually count people? Maybe. Uh, but then again, there is the question, how do you actually count people and why these guys, I mean, the pros in the industry, why do they put the cameras on top? and not in front. It's usually, at least as far as I know, to avoid occlusion. If you put a camera, like, like this camera right now is in front of me, and if I go in front of it, but someone is hidden behind me and goes with me, you cannot track this person. Uh, if you have a camera on top, unless you're holding a child on your shoulders, you will track every single person without any doubts, because you won't have any occlusion between the camera and the body of the, of, of the person. So would you put a temperature camera on top and would it work as good? I'm not sure. As far as I've seen today, all these camera, these temperature cameras need to be facing you and to detect the, the shape of your face and to measure the heat here and do an average of the heat of the detected face. So maybe two different systems, two different pieces of hardware to do two different things. Again, if you know a camera that does both, please let us know. Share that with us. Yeah, and I remain ignorant about that too. Even for temperature sensing, can you keep moving for a temperature sensor, or do you have to stop? Uh, I've seen some which requires to stand up to three seconds. So this one for sure that wouldn't work. Uh, so more higher end, and and these were like a few hundred bucks cameras. Uh, some which are close closer to a thousand bucks cameras would maybe be faster with some uh, uh, dozens of milliseconds. Now, do you want to put several thousand cameras in the store? That's another question. Uh, new question from Jonathan. Uh, what is the exact model of the right side monitor you had in the example and stand for it? So uh, the, the right side player was the X-T4 which is, uh, where do we have it? Which is this one, something like this, the purple box. And the monitor you saw is actually my desktop monitor mounted on a, a desk arm. So nothing fancy, nothing to put in store. That's a regular, what is, this one is a BenQ, 24 inches uh, screen, which I use on my desk. Uh, actually, uh, if you want to see all the questions we get, that's the, the monitor I was using. And I'm just using a regular Amazon arm behind to hold it on my desk. So nothing fancy here. Just a cool home office setup. <laughs> Hi, welcome, Jonathan. All right. Uh, new question from Corey. The phone-based clicker you showed was a web page, not an experience built-in interface. Yes, that's correct. Uh, again, on the Help Center article, which we're looking at right now, if you scroll down, uh, you have here tracking visitor using a personal mobile device. It's actually the same mechanism we've been using the, in the real estate shop window. So the URL is here. And if I open this right now, that's the web page. So imagine this on a, on a phone form factor. And you can see that this page awaits an API key an experience name, a tag, and an entrance. So that would answer as well the question we had earlier about how do I know that this phone is connected to a specific entrance that is encoded in the URL itself. 
the URL being available in the QR code uh, in the settings scene. So you scan the code as an employee, you get the, URL, the correct URL on your phone, and you're connected to the system. The web page is the web page is here. The script is here, and the CSS is here. Nothing fancy again. Uh, very basic web pages. So you have all the source code available uh, in, at the end of the Help Center article. And it's a really simple page. Yes. You're welcome, Corey. I'd say 30 minutes of Q&A is a good way to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, okay, we'll let's take this. we Roberts, and then uh, we'll call it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's that's fine. So uh, Robert's question, uh, I like the idea of Python scripts. I have written Python scripts to do things we've experienced before. Is there any plans to incorporate Python into the players so that it wouldn't need to put on every device manually and you can run scripts? Um, it's not in the roadmap, as far as I know, for sure. Uh, although it is, you can definitely run the Python scripts on your machines. Uh, and as we've seen, in the Python script, calling a local network trigger or a web trigger is pretty easy, right? So you can connect this Python script quite easily to the experience to send some commands. Um, and so far, because this is a proof of concept, which is not bulletproof, which is was testing in my apartment with my ceiling, which is not that high, we, want, we are not planning to publish the code yet. Uh, but we did put the link here to the Intel original demo we've been using. So you can start from there uh, if you want to, to, to work on this on this proof of concept. And because this is going to be the really last question, uh, on the proof of concept, we were using not a 3D cameras, uh, a regular webcam, my usual uh, Logitech C920, which I I'm using right now in part. Yeah, some, some solutions use 2D, some use 3D. What we did in the example is 2D, so any webcam will do. Thank you, right. everybody, for joining us. Sebastian, thank you for your genius contribution to this webinar and to the experience. And a shout out to Alexi Camacho, who yep. uh, led the construction of this experience as well. Thank you, Alexi. Uh, if you have other reference ideas, please let us know. We intend to have a library of reference designs, so stay tuned for more anyway. Uh, this is just the beginning. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Seb. Bye, guys.